Hello and welcome to Horse Race Politics. Uh, I'm Dr. Matthew Wall. I'm a political scientist at Swansea University and I'm joined by my colleagues. Hi, my name is Dr. Elena Kilby and I'm a lecturer in journalism at the Department of Media and Communication. And I'm Dr. Richard Thomas. I'm a senior lecturer in journalism in the same department as Elena. So all three of us are academics that specialise in the study of political campaigns and political communication. And what we've done here, we've created this podcast to share our analysis of the 2020 US presidential election campaign in real time as it unfolds, using information from political gambling markets to keep score. So the podcast will drop each Friday running into the vote and it'll bring you up to speed with the state of the race and it'll help you to filter out the noise of the campaign and focuses on the stories, trends and the big moments that really matter. So on this first episode, uh, we're going to be talking about why we study political campaigns and how gambling odds can help us to understand them. Uh, We'll talk a little bit about the changing media and political environment facing the candidates and voters in this election, uh, as well as the story so far, uh, which has seen dramatic ups and downs since Joe Biden emerged as the presumptive Democratic candidate in late March. So, okay, guys, so um, we've made it to the big time. We have our own podcast this is, I think, for all of us, the first step out of academia, right? That's the, that's the idea. I guess, yeah, I kind of wanted to start off by, yeah, by asking uh, the two of you, how is it that you come to be a specialist in the study of political campaigns and what approach do you bring to bear on it? My interest in this particular area stems from wanting to come to university in the first place. Um, I, my main area of investigation in terms of university research is political TV satire, um, the likes of The Daily Show and Last Week Tonight um, with John Oliver. And I was really interested um, way back in, uh, I think it was 2008, just before um, Barack Obama won the presidency, was how mm. political TV satire was reporting these programmes because quite a large demographic of particularly young people between the ages of 18 and 35 gravitate towards those shows to learn about politics. And it's also a really good resource resource for people that are actually sick and tired of conventional news programming. This is actually a, a platform that that kind of age range gravitate towards. So I thought that was quite kind of a very interesting platform to see how these particular programs are reporting elections. And what I've done over the years is I've interviewed the American public, but also uh, use quantitative approaches to analysing the shows as well to give a kind of a good overview of the ways in which they report uh, the presidential elections. Yeah, it's funny um, thinking back to that 2008 campaign because obviously um, the vice presidential candidate on the Republican side, Sarah Palin, mm-hmm. I think that was the first time I'd seen satire where the the sketch was just repeating verbatim the exact speech that the candidate had given. Yeah, um, it, se- it seemed to be a good time for that kind of thing to, yeah. to break through. I think there was there was no irony there at all. It was just state of reporting from Tina Fey as, as to what Sarah Palin was doing. I think it, it nearly it worked, though, as well as a piece mm-hmm. of comedy, right? Which oh, yeah, is, definitely. Uh, so, so maybe there's hidden depths to Sarah Palin we hadn't quite perceived. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe I'd go over to yourself, Richard, then, and, and you could tell us how you've come into this this area. Well, I, I remember ever since I can remember, actually, being fascinated by elections. I remember staying up as a kid all night because I was just fascinated with the sort of, you know, the way that the results were announced, um, the drama of it all, the theatre mm-hmm. of it all. Um, so I've always been interested in um, politics. I also remember before I became a student, actually, um, way back in 2000, I was actually uh, the night of the hanging chad. I, I, I'm sure you could remember that. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, w- I was actually in a bar in Chicago um, watching that unfold. All of that drama. I can mm. I can also confirm that um, the chad wasn't the only thing that was hanging by the end of <laughs> that night. Um, so I be- became a student, a mature student, and the sort of early research projects that I became involved in were really the study of uh, particularly the coverage of election. Uh, elections on the television. Got involved with lots of projects. In fact, Elena was involved in many of the same things uh, that I was doing uh, and was w- working with Professor Stephen Cushion at Cardiff University. That all culminated our work in a book that we published in 2018, uh, Reporting Elections, Rethinking the Logic of Campaign Coverage. So what's really good from, from the point of view of research and its impact is that that sort of work has 
um, some resonance indeed with with the people who are running British television, and they are interested in hearing from us the results, what went right, what went wrong, the sort of quantitative analysis that we produce about uh, trends, patterns, things that were happening again and again, things that were being concentrated on, things that were being ignored, and so on. So this podcast, for me, is is a really interesting new diversion, I think because, um, and Elena would, would back me up here, I'm sure, is that when we're involved in media, the big question is, what impact does the media have? Mm-hmm. And I think now that we can map, we can map new stories to fluctuations in the betting market, that's a really good measure, I think, just to see what sort of uh, new stories along this election campaign are having some resonance with the public. I just just wanted to add to that, really. Um, I think what, what's going to be interesting in terms of what we're looking at here, and my area in, in particular is is satire. And it's been interesting over the years that how that's actually become quite legitimate as 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 a as a news platform. So it'll be interesting to see as well in terms of the mainstream stories that we're going to be covering within this podcast, but to see how alternative news stories that are covered by these influential TV satirists, how they maybe influence or help fluctuate, you know, what we're going to be looking at in terms of the markets and uh, the, the betting markets. Well, yeah, so I'll just just from my own perspective, I guess I can't kind of came into campaigns because it like kind of like Richard said, it's kind of the most fun thing that happens in politics. So a lot of politics is very boring. And uh, I, it, there's a famous book about a, a recent campaign in Ireland called Showtime. You know, it's it's that kind of uh, Hollywood for ugly people kind of comes into <laughs> into effect. And I suppose also being from Ireland, like there's a long tradition where Hang I'm on, from. Hang on, Matt. Matt, sorry. Yeah. What was that? You're from Ireland? You might have noticed the, oh, right. the accent. There's a really long tradition of betting on politics, you know. And like as long back as I can remember, the politicians betting on their own parties to do well is actually like a, a standard photo call in an Irish election campaign. Um, so I'd, I'd always associated politics uh, and betting. But yeah, I started researching really whether you could use the the prices that you can get on a betting market to, to kind of track the course of, of a political campaign. Um, and betting markets have some amazing properties in that regard. So I just looked up uh, Betfair, which is one of the companies that that does this, and on just one market on the U.S. presidential election, like they had over eighty-five million pounds in in matched bets, wow. and that's just wow. one betting company. And so, what that what's what's happening there is all these basically all these ideas about how likely the the results of the election are, are being kind of fed into these prices in real time, um, and as they vary, we can kind of get a sense of. Um, people's perceptions of the likelihood of the candidates uh, winning a much more granular way than um, surveys, kind of more traditional methods. And so what we're trying to do here, I suppose, in this pod is to link that a little bit to to the media side of things, to what the, what the big stories are, what you know, what what's happening in the in the campaign. Um, so to give you, in a sense, one number of how close the election is, but then kind of explain how we how we got there. So with that in mind, I thought we could kind of talk a bit about the media in, in the US, um, some of the kind of, well, some of the continuities, because um, I know I know you guys are interested in continuity with, with regard to things like TV, but also the changes that, that digital has brought along. Yeah, I think one of the things that we look at very closely in the UK each year is Ofcom, the regulator uh, of broadcasters, bring out um, a report each year, which is a news consumption report. And we surprise students, actually, every year when we tell them this, that the, the still the king of the jungle in terms of news is the television. Um, many people assume it to be social media, uh, online journalism, online platforms, but it's still the television. Now, the gap is closing each year, true, but um, I think it's significant uh, that, that the television is still so influential and so it is the case in the US, and I've got, uh, I've just got some some data in front of me actually, uh, which was produced by the Pew Research Center in January of this year, and they did a poll of a thousand people, and they asked them um, who was uh, who was um, where did they get their news from, and they sort of divided that up across uh, political lines. 
So I think what's significant um, is that the first one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, the first seven platforms for where people go for their political news are television platforms. The first what we would call a you know newspaper in inverted commas is the New York Times, um, which is eighth in the list. So I think the importance of television uh, is still relevant. Um, of course, we know, don't we, that in the US, the, the sort of choice is very wide. Mm-hmm. You have your middle of the road channels, um, ABC, NBC, CBS, um, and then you've got them uh, sort of becoming a little bit more partisan. And I think the important thing for us to remember is across all US adults, as per this research I've got in front of me, Fox News, which we know is is very right of centre, is still the most relied upon television channel for US adults. Well, fascinating. Uh, it's, uh, it's funny because, again, in a kind of a British context, there was actually, I don't know if you guys hear, there was talk of setting up a kind of a British version of Fox News yes. mm-hmm. uh, yeah. in the yeah. newspapers recently. So maybe we're maybe we're trending in that direction. But for a lot of UK people to see Fox News when you see it on YouTube or like clips of it, it does seem remarkably, you know, uh, ideologically informed. Yeah. Like that is that is quite a significant difference to the UK where the, the broadcasting rules are much tighter in terms of, of course. What, uh, yeah. I mean, TV stations, you know, this is this is one of the debating points around Fox starting in the UK because they have some fairly strict impartiality obligations that they would have to navigate around. And as you rightly say, Matt, if you've watched Fox News recently, um, impartiality is not necessarily a word that you would attach to it. But then the same could be said about the other side. Mm -hmm. If you look at MSNBC, you'll find that they are equally ideologically positioned against the right and for the left. So, Mm -hmm. um, I, I suppose in some ways, and I'm sure Elena will have a take on this as well, that you know a lot of a lot of voters are sort of polarizing to those extremes in terms of the the television choice. Yeah, I think um what's actually interesting with those kind of demographics between both of those, you know, cheerlead what we would call maybe cheerleading for the different political affiliated parties. So MSNBC would be the Democrats, Fox News would be the Republicans, um, is the fact that I think as you say, Richard, it's mainly with Fox News, uh, mainly over 60s, white, middle class male audience. But um, what's interesting with those on the left is that they tend to have much more varied, uh, me- a much more varied media diet, let's say. So they might gravitate towards MSNBC, but they're also gravitating towards the big network channels as well, like ABC, um, NBC. But I think what we also need to take into consideration, there was a really good uh, New York Times article about this over the last couple of weeks, talking about the influence of right-wing influencers on Facebook and how they're actually dominating the discussion by drowning out these kind of mainstream media arguments and opposing views um, with regards to Trump. So there's a lot to be said there, um, particularly when we may not get to see that because we're all we all have our own filter bubbles and we're all kind of shouting into our own respective echo chambers but even Mm. though that you know facebook and it has quite uh older demographic um that are engaging with those stories that's not to say we don't know what's going on with other forms of uh social media platforms like instagram and uh obviously the issue around tiktok and whether that's going to be banned at some point. So um, there's lots of kind of variables at play here that uh, will be interesting to look at over the coming weeks. Yeah, yeah. There's, it, it's the, the fragmentation of media, I suppose, has been the overriding theme yeah. across, you know, really what, the last 40, even 50 years uh, as, as media has, has developed uh, over time. You know, um, Pippa Norris, one of, the, one of the people who writes about this, talks about this as the kind of postmodern, era you know bruce Springsteen talks about 57 channels and nothing on you know so so that and, and tiktok and you snapchat all these instagram they're kind of the latest iteration of that, mm-hmm. that fragmentation. and as far as broadcasting goes matt in the us as well of course there's been this continual slide towards deregulation starting from the times of ronald reagan yeah. um and the and the abandonment of the fairness doctrine which was that sort of measure that was there just to keep that little bit of balance involved. Those things have been left behind. So now pretty much it's, you know, it, it, it you pays your money and you takes your choice on, on US broadcasting. And as Elena 
as mentioned, you know, some people will do a bit of shopping around and they look for different opinions. Other um, potential voters, you know, will gravitate to the ideology that they sort of ascribe to. And um, um, but I think that deregulation has been very important because um, for those of us who've researched both, you know, you will see things on American political television that you will never see on British television because of the the stricter rules that we have mm-hmm. well i think i think that kind of segues into um a little bit what we're going to start to talk about now which is sort of how we've gotten to where we are in terms of in terms of the likelihood of the two candidates to win at least uh at least in terms of the average price that you can get on them in the betting uh, so we might be wrong but you can win money off us if we are i suppose mm. um so so really like um we had a look at the at the data um sort of starting in in uh, late March when you know um Bernie Sanders really started to fall away I think it was the 8th of April he he bowed out formally um and we identified kind of three turning points uh in the in the election that that I'd like to to talk about so like right at the start Trump kind of opens up with the lead about being about 8% more likely I mean still quite close but we sort of see in late May, towards the end of July, well, well, something I've tr- tried to call like the Trump slump, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah. like like all through June and July and starting in late May, we see like it, it's on the, you know, they go, they go level with each other on June 2nd. And really through most of June and July, Biden is well fancied by most people, you know, 20 to 24 percent more likely to win than Trump. I wonder, Richard, did you have any thoughts about sort of what was, what happened to to turn that tide? Uh, I've done a, a sort of a timeline based on um, some British headlines. Actually, I looked at the Guardian and also the Times, and I I've just looked at everything from the middle of May just to try and get that left right balance, just to see what the key events in this whole campaign were. And um, a few things were going on in May, but I think the two major things perhaps were involved involved with president trump's dealing with the covid pandemic when he made claims that he'd been taking the drug the untried unapproved drug mm-hmm. which i've been trying practicing trying to say the word <laughs> all day but I, I still haven't adequately <laughs> mastered that in order to say it yeah. so it begins with h you Hydroxy, know what i'm talking about queen or that's something. the one yeah, uh, yeah. so that that was obviously a, a major a major um event um that attracted a lot of news coverage the other thing uh that happened in may was um unemployment re- rise um increased in the uk by two uh, in the US by two point four million, uh, and then on the twenty fifth, of course, we, major event which has had an impact obviously across the world since, which was the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis. Mm-hmm. So that happened towards right towards the end of May. I can honestly say from there on in, it, it, it's been a real disaster in terms of news events for President Trump. And in in many ways, it looks like um, Joe Biden has not actually had to do much Mm -hmm. because of all of the negative things uh, and the negative press that um, President Trump was attracting. I mean, I could bore you to death with all of this stuff that was going on, but there were some, you know, lots of civil unrest, of course, that we know all about that and the the rising of the BLM uh, movement. Lots of of talk around around that. Um, then we had the book from former uh, defence advisor John Bolton, which the information about that was just sort of serialised and trickling out on a on a gradual basis. Lots of talk about him being unfit for office and uh, that he would go rogue in a second term and and start a war with with North Korea. Then we had the the empty um, the empty event at Tulsa. Where mm. where six and a half thousand people were there instead of the nineteen thousand that were supposed to go. So you know I could go on. There's lots and lots of of things that that happened in June and July. And and I have to say, looking at the headlines, Joe Biden was fairly passive. He, he wasn't doing a lot. And you might argue they didn't have to do a lot. Yeah, well, I remember we were talking at the time, and we said just just Biden stay in your basement. You know, like it let, yeah. let, let Trump make make the run, make the running. I remember as well, like uh, I think that was around the same time the kind of 
why don't you inject like bleach into your body? Uh, yeah. yeah. Suggestion uh, was was prominent. And I wonder, Lena, were any of those uh, pieces of health advice uh, taken up in social media or sort of satirized? They were definitely satirized. But this is the thing. I, I mean, I've been watching these programs for such an incredibly long time. And, you know, we, as, as researchers, we do have to remain impartial in terms of, you know, how we approach and analyze these programs. But my fear is, I mean, with with these types of programs satirizing stories like this, um, whether it's Trump, you know, ask, you know, requesting people to do just that or his handling of, of COVID in general or how his latest rally in Nevada has um, violated the state's COVID uh, rules. All of this, to a certain extent, is you're preaching to a converted audience. So even though that the points they make are fair, and it's good to see that they're being satirized. I mean, this audience is going to be familiar with those arguments anyway. So they're going to agree with those. And this, this brings us back to that idea of partisanship. So even though satire in itself can be considered an alternative form of media, it's actually preaching to a, a relatively liberal or educated audience, essentially. Yeah, it's interesting. And then, well, so then a sort of what's what's remarkable then is in August, and I wish I'd put some money on this because I, when we were <laughs> setting this podcast up, you guys might recall, I said, this is going to narrow, I right? Do, like yeah. nearly every campaign yeah. narrows yeah. and I could, I could cash it. out. Well, you know, I never put the, the bloody money on the on, on the bet and I watched the campaign narrow. So um, that, that goes to show how wise I am, I suppose. <laughs> uh, but we did see and we, you know, it was a, a pretty remarkable trend really from the kind of third or fourth of August right to the end of the month and, and, and into early September, we go from that 24 more or less percent lead in terms of probability for Biden into back into evens more or less, back into like a 50-50 um, proposition. So the tide turned pretty dramatically back towards uh, Trump uh, in, in, yeah. in that month. How did, how did that happen, Richard? I mean, we had this sort of perfect storm you just talked about. What, yeah. what was the turning or did, did you, did you well, see something? August, of course, was convention mm -hmm. month. Um, but before we got as far as that, there was a few things uh, that happened. Obviously, uh, Biden picked his running mate, Kamala Harris. Uh, that pleased some people a lot. Um, it annoyed a lot of other people. We also had uh, one of two of the things that Biden actually did. He made what's been reported as a race blunder, um, talking about Latino audiences and African-American audiences and you know that was interpreted in a particular way that that I think that we put that down as a negative mm -hmm. um for him but perhaps there was some sympathy in some way for president trump his brother died just before the convention we had yet another book about trump which was by a, a guy called jeffrey tubin who's a lawyer now writes for the new yorker apparently a very good read, so the review goes, that I read. Mm -hmm. We had some claims by Trump about whether Kamala Harris is actually eligible to be a vice president. Mm -hmm. That was um, a bit of a sort of stirring the pot up a little there. Then we had these two conventions. Um, we had the Obamas weighing in, obviously, with with on the side of the, of the Democrats. Uh, and really, um, you could argue that that was, in some ways, that was a bit of a sort of neutral month, but it obviously rumbling around in the background. You had these terrible figures increasing, um, mm -hmm. uh, COVID cases, COVID deaths. Um, you had the, you know, the incredible um, numbers of unemployment. You also had on the 22nd, which you would have thought was, was a, uh, an event very much in Biden's favour, you had uh, Republican security chiefs, 70 of them, 7-0, um, supporting Biden and coming out and saying, vote for him. Mm. I mean, these are these are Republicans. Um, we also had Trump's sister calling him a cruel liar yeah. on the uh, eve of, 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 the, of the convention. You could argue that, that the month of August was a bit more sort of balanced. There were good things and bad things uh, happening for, for both uh, people there. One thing that I noticed, Elena, was how the discussion around the Black Lives Matter um, movement um, that, that Richard mentioned, kind of talking about the early part of the campaign, mm -hmm. sort of shifted towards a kind of, I mean, Trump was just tweeting in capital letters, law, law and order, and it was about sending in uh, kind of federal troops, you know, that the discussion seemed to, it seemed to be a topic that Trump wanted to talk about, mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to coronavirus, which he's consistently 
sought to downplay. Did you see much evidence of that? A kind of, I guess, an evolution in the politicization of, of BLM? I, I think so. I mean, this is, I mean, he has a kind of hardened fan base, really, um, that will be quite happy to hear that rather than the 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 actual figures around COVID, which I think are hitting around nearly 200,000 deaths. Probably at by this the time point. this goes out, it, it probably will be, yeah. Yeah, in and around that. So I think he's been happy to have that conversation because obviously there is an, an opposition to that, whether it be all lives matter. So I think it's it's possibly easier for him to have that conversation than have that wider conversation about COVID. I mean, I think there was that Bob Woodward uh, Woodward book that has come out yeah. mm-hmm. in the last couple of weeks where he's actually admitted that, yeah, he kind of played down the seriousness of COVID um, to, to keep the economy going and to, to keep everybody calm. So I guess the conversation around BLM, what, whatever, whatever side that you're on, is much more beneficial to him than having that conversation about COVID. I mean, one thing that's been kind of interesting over the last couple of weeks, and I know this is um, something that Samantha B has been reporting in a show Full Frontal in the last couple of weeks, is this politicising um, a vaccine for COVID. Um, mm. The idea that Trump is saying that there'll be um, a vaccine for COVID two days before the election and he will be responsible for that. So, yeah, it's um, it's interesting the conversation with the way the conversation goes, actually. And I, I suppose BLM, whatever side is 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 helpful for him. You, you mentioned the book, Elena, by Bob Woodward. Now, obviously, Bob Woodward is, is half of, of the most famous journalistic duo in the history of journalism, probably. Obviously, mm-hmm. the and he's re- he's responsible for bringing down a Republican president. Um, it just makes you think. I don't know if you wondered the same as me, both of you. Why on earth did he agree <laughs> to be interviewed by Bob Woodward? Uh, you can understand other people writing books. Um, you know, you've got no control over that. But if you're going to give an interview to a journalist, why Bob Woodward? It, it doesn't make any logical sense to me. I think from what I can remember, I was listening to a podcast on this on Sky News um, a couple of days ago, was the fact that his aides just told him in the past to nev- never be interviewed by Bob Woodward. And he has never been happy with what he said about him. So he agreed to do, I think it was 17 interviews in total. And then yeah. when it came out, he just denied that. No, it's fake news. It's rubbish. I mean, I mean, you could argue that that's making a mistake, but it, it's even you know it's different to that. It's making the same mistake seventeen times. <laughs> yes. but, um, well, it does bring us to that kind of uh, coming right up to to when we're recording, uh, which is the twenty first. Um, you know, around that same time, at least the kind of early quotes from the um, the Woodward book were coming out. We do see this kind of weak relatively weak comeback from Biden, um, which leaves us with him about six, seven, seven percent favorite, which is pretty, pretty close in betting, to be honest with you. Um, but that did seem to happen. Yeah, as I say, around this, around the 7th, 6th or 7th of September, we see it goes from 50, 50 back up to, to, to Biden marginally um, in front. And I wonder, was was the Woodward book maybe a part of that uh, shift? Possibly the the Woodward book was part of that, but the the this idea of the um, Latino vote um, moving further towards Trump um, mm-hmm. sort of perhaps you know doesn't support that. I I, I found a, a poll that's been done very recently in the last few days by NBC and uh, Wall Street Journal, um, and it looks at the issues that Americans are saying are the most important. Um, now, I know there's a probably an interesting discussion we could probably have in a future week, Matt, mm-hmm. about pol- pollsters versus betting markets, Absolutely. which is probably be quite interesting. But um, w- what this shows is, is quite interesting because it's brought down um, the advantage uh, on, a, on an issue basis. So the issue, according to this poll, that 40% of Americans are most concerned about is the economy. And on the economy... This poll gives Trump a ten percent advantage. Mm-hmm. On on the next one, COVID, which is twenty four percent, Biden is ahead twenty two. Healthcare, he's ahead twenty two. Race relations, he's ahead twenty four. Protecting immigrant rights, he's ahead thirty two. Climate change, he's ahead of thirty nine. The things that Trump are is ahead on, as I've said, is the big one: the economy, uh, crime and violence, ahead two percent. Uh, policies towards China ahead nine percent, and securing the border ahead sixteen. Now, I mean, I'm sure, I I would imagine 
that the that the sort of strategists in the Trump camp are going to be trying to play to the strength here, which is um, that that Trump is going to look after the economy uh, better than Biden. Uh, but that was very interesting because even with this terrible pandemic going on and the the uh, death rate uh, rising, you know, very dramatically. The economy is still the thing that people are most interested in. But of course, that is connected to COVID anyway, isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. interesting. There was um, an interview with uh, Women for Trump uh, I was listening to on, on Sky News a few days ago. And they were having that conversation about, well, you know, how, how do you feel about how his views on women? And a lot of these women said, we don't care. As long as he can serve the economy and improve that, then we don't really care what he feels about other things. Yeah, and it's interesting. I mean, right into coming into the coronavirus um, period, like he had performed well on the economy mm-hmm. by, by most objective measures. Now, how sustainable that performance was, that's that's more difficult. But, you know, so I wonder, is there a kind of plausibility of saying, well, the economy is going well until this essentially like outside force, the coronavirus came along. Um, and so, yeah, but it's funny, I, I haven't heard him talking much about the economy. You know, normally you'd, you'd expect someone with that kind of lead to to be pushing that agenda yeah mm-hmm. uh, well i think i think we can um, we can imagine that we're you know we can see that in in the weeks ahead and of course yeah. i think what we've got to keep sight of as well is we're not far now away from televised debate season yes um yeah and that that's gonna that's gonna have i think a big impact on on what happens next the first one um is going to be on the 29th of september then another one on the 15th of October, the final one on the 22nd. So, you know, over this next sort of clutch of a month, that's going to be, I think that's going to be something that inevitably we're going to be talking about on our podcast, mm-hmm. here, aren't we? Yeah, and, you know, that just to, just to kind of wrap, wrap things up, I mean, when when I use these gambling odds, one of the, yeah, the, one of the things they were best for showing really before even polling came out was who'd won, <laughs> who'd won the, the debate and what kind of the scale of that uh Mm-hmm. victory was um so so yeah well i, I suppose really that leaves us uh, that leaves us here uh, for the moment uh, it's a story so far as they say we've got biden through a rather circuitous route slightly really only slightly favored over donald trump but as as richard says it's sort of all to play for in the next two or three weeks really uh, yeah. with 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 debate season so yeah, I hope you join us next Friday where we can hopefully bring you up to speed and we'll just be focusing on one week rather than three months, so it might be a little bit easier. Um, so yeah, I'd just like to say thanks for joining us. Thanks to Richard and uh, thanks to Elena. I'd just like to close by saying that the funding for this podcast comes from Swansea University's Cherish Digital Economy Centre under their Research Escalator Scheme. So thanks very much for joining us and we'll see you next week. Thank you.